Well, let's go into chapter 18. It says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And that's about a 50 mile journey. Um, uh, we've done that. We've, we've left Athens and rented a car and driven over to Corinth, about 50 miles. So, a couple days' journey for him. And uh, he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy uh, with his wife Priscilla. And eventually he'll go back to Italy, and that's where Rome is. And so uh, he becomes part of the, the church at Rome. But he's a long ways away. He's at the very bottom of, um, of Greece. He's with his wife Priscilla. Uh, because Claudius, the emperor, had commanded all the Jews needed to depart from Rome. That happened there. It also happened later in history in, in Spain, where they said all the Jews need to leave. And so it has happened in different parts of history. So they ended up in, in Corinth. And uh, they were in business. They were tent makers. Verse 3 says that they were in the same trade as, as, uh, uh, as Paul. And so uh, he stayed with them and worked uh, for their tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Now, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, so they went back up to the north, uh, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. So he didn't start there, but he, he, uh, he would get there. Uh, uh, in this case here, the Spirit led. that you need, to pre you need to present that. Jesus is the Christ. Well, when he does that, uh, you could say all hell breaks loose. Things get really difficult. And when they opposed him and blasphemed, that means that they said something about Jesus. He shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and he entered the, into the house of a certain man named Justice, uh, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed. He believed on the Lord with all his household, and many Corinthians, hearing and believed, were baptized. And so this is, uh, this is pretty intense. Corinth is not a very big place. It's had a large population. They had a lot of tenement houses, I, I suppose, had a large population. I forget what those numbers are right now. But, but geographically, uh, we could walk all over Corinth. It wasn't that big. It'd be spread out like, like our little village of Penyan here probably would fit uh, comfortably within the village limits of our, our, our village here. You could walk all over easily. And um, so uh, there's a synagogue. Right next door to it is a house, and that's where Paul ends up going. And people are getting saved. People are getting baptized in water. Uh, ruler of the synagogue, Crispus. Now, the ruler of the synagogue, what would we call today the pastor? the leader, so the word ruler. So Paul would say things like the elders need to rule. And it's, a, it's a, just a transference of that same kind of thing from Judaism. And so many Corinthians were, were uh, believed, were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul uh, in, an, in the night by a vision. So Paul has a, a spiritual experience while he's down there. And here's what Jesus said to Paul in the night. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not be silent. Do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Oh, uh, what I wouldn't give to hear something like that in some of the places that I've been. Uh, it must have just set Paul free just to be bold, just go at it. Uh, maybe he would have left there's opposition in town the opposition has released uh, when he started preaching jesus is the christ but to hear jesus say i'm with you and um, don't leave be bold speak up and because i have many people in this place well the jesus uh, is the one who calls those things that are not as though they were he's saying this by faith I have many people in this place, many Christians uh, came to be 
but that at the time he said this, that hadn't happened yet. He calls those things that are not as though they were. I have many people in the city. So he continued there a year and six months, and that's the longest um, that he's been anywhere, a year and six months uh, teaching the Word of God among them. Uh, that's interesting. So he, he really puts down roots, spends a long time with them, and establishes one of the great churches. Uh, Corinth had a lot of problems. You can read it in the letters. First and Second Corinthians had a lot of problems in the church, but it's a dynamic church. And it's the, a spirit-filled church, the gifts of spirit. Paul never writes for a moment to question whether they're genuine or not. They were ignorant in how they're to be used and uh, uh, were carnal, but the gifts of spirit were real. So in a, in a year and a half, stop and think about this in terms of church planting. In a year and a half, uh, these people are swimming in the things of the spirit. They're moving in the power of God. They're prophesying. They're uh, all speaking in tongues. I mean, it's a powerful thing when you stop and think of it because I, I've seen people plant churches where years go by and none of that happens. Uh, Paul went right to work and established in a year and a half, had a vital, vibrant, spirit-filled church, an amazing church, actually, and uh, in a very, very short time. So... Um, Verse 12, Luke always includes historical facts that help us date when these things happen, but also he weaves it in it so naturally uh, that it just shows how authentic these books are because you could prove this uh, without even using the Bible. You can go to history and prove that what happened here is true. Verse 12, he says, when uh, Gallio, Gallio was pro council of Achaia, Achaia was the province, Corinth is in uh, in that province, just like Macedonia is a province and in it is Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. Uh, it's the province of Achaia. Um, uh, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. And it's called the Burma. And when you're in Corinth and you're walking among the ruins, there's this uh, pro-council's judgment seat. And it's got the name uh, of the proconsul, it's, 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 it's the Burma. It's where people were brought uh, both for judgment and to be given uh, civic awards. And uh, they brought Paul. They, they, now they can't just kill him. They can't just persecute him. So they're going to try to find a way to do it legally or to get the government to punish him, to get the government to deal with it, bring him before the, the Burma, the, the, the judgment seat. Um, What's interesting is we will all stand before the Burma, the judgment seat of Christ. It's the same thing for what we have done or what we haven't done. And uh, we'll either be given rewards or we'll be given punishment, but we'll all stand before the Burma, the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul, Paul preaches that. So uh, when Paul was um, ab about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there'd be reason why I should bear with you. But if it's a question of words, of names, of uh, your own law, look to this yourself. I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. And all the Greeks took Sathias, the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio looked the other way or took no notice of these things. So Paul still remained a good while, and then he took leave. And so even though it's a hot spot, even though he just uh, uh, was almost uh, persecuted by using the law against them, which happens many places where they get the civic authorities to actually arrest people, for preaching the gospel. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth would go to places like Sweden and, and, and Denmark. And uh, the, the pastors who are opposed to the healing ministry of Jesus that Smith was preaching, the pastors would have the local civic uh, leaders arrest Smith, throw him in jail on uh, some, some charge, some violation, because they had no power in themselves to stop him. 
Oftentimes he'd be arrested for practicing medicine without a license. And so one way that he'd get around it, you know, he'd be forbidden to lay hands by the civic leaders. He couldn't lay hands on anybody. So he'd have all these people in a, in a city park and he'd get them, he said, lay hands on yourself. Put your hand on what, what hurts. And they would put their hands on themselves and he'd pray a prayer and Jesus would heal them. And it would make the, the pastors who are opposed to the full gospel so angry because there's nothing that they could do to stop that from happening. So Paul stayed a while longer, and that, that, again, takes great courage. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria. Now, Syria is the capital of Syria, or the place in Syria that he's headed is Antioch. In other words, he's headed for back to his home congregation. And we see this pattern consistently, that Paul was sent out and always came back and gave an account for what happened. And uh, says that Priscilla and Aquila, they were with him, so they're, they're on the trip as well. And um, then he does something very different. He cut off us here in, in Centria and um, had taken a vow. And th this, this place here is where um, Pris uh, uh, not Priscilla, um, the, the woman preacher, uh, just escaped my mind. Paul wrote about her to the Romans, sent a letter with her to the Romans, uh, but it's her hometown. And um, let's just see if I can find that. Centria is a, a very small village. You can see it from um, Corinth. It's, it's, it's a neighboring village. And uh, it's the hometown of Phoebe. And Paul writes uh, about Phoebe to the Romans in Romans chapter 16. And he uh, sends her with his uh, commendation. He also says in verse 3, to greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ. So they're in Rome working in the church there as well. But this uh, uh, Sancria is, is the home, uh, hometown of Phoebe. And uh, there Paul got his haircut and then took a vow. Now he's not reverting to Judaism. Uh, Paul said uh, in another place, he said, I become all things to all men. He's heading back to Syria. He's uh, uh, gonna go to Antioch, but then he's gonna make his way to, to Jerusalem. And um, he's taken a vow, and uh, his purpose is to somehow uh, be able to continue to work with the Jews. And so it uh, says he came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Uh, but he himself entered the synagogue uh, and reasoned with the Jews. And they asked him to stay longer, a longer time, but he could not consent. He took leave of them saying, I must by all means keep the coming feast in Jerusalem, but I, ret I will return to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And so he's, he's got his eye on something. He feels that he needs to get to Jerusalem. This whole thing of having his head shaven, the whole thing of, of taking a vow uh, isn't reverting to Judaism. It's all part of what he's doing of, of trying to bring the gospel to Jerusalem. And when he had landed in Caesarea, he had gone up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. And after he spent some time there and departed, he went over the region of Galatia and uh, Phrygia in order to strengthen all the disciples. Now, I'm not pronouncing all of these names. These are Greek names. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce them. I'd have to hear it, I suppose, but uh, that's my best attempt. Uh, verse 24. Now, a Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria. Alexandria would be the North Africa, uh, a Roman center, and um, uh, became the center of the church eventually. He was an eloquent man and mighty in scriptures. And so he doesn't know the Lord. His name is Apollos. He doesn't know the Lord, but he's mighty in scriptures. I think, I think an unbeliever uh, could just really get into God's word, master it, get on top of it, uh, 
uh, he's an eloquent man, so he, he's uh, able to really speak. He came to Ephesus. And this man, being instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only knew the baptism of John. So he's not born again, but he, he caught something. He caught something of, of what to preach and how to preach it. He's fervent in spirit. This guy's on fire. There are people like this. There are people I, I listen to who are even politically oriented, and I think, boy, he, he, could, he could preach. If, if, if he was uh, introduced to Jesus, boy, he's eloquent. He's got uh, a, a sense of righteousness, a sense of what's right. Uh, this man's, uh, he knows the way of the Lord, what pleases the Lord. He's fervent in spirit. He's teaching many things accurately, but he's missing something. And, and the baptism of John happened about 20 years before this. And so, so he's a Jew. All the Jews were supposed to be baptized by John. So he submitted to that. And it was such a life-changing experience. It wasn't everything, but it was, it was something. It changed people's lives. It, changed, it softened their hearts. It made them come alive to the Word of God. And so he began speaking boldly in the synagogue at Ephesus. And when Aquila, Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross uh, to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who believed through, uh, through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Now, what's interesting is, is this guy was doing something with what he had. He was missing an important element, a key ingredient. Priscilla and Aquila somehow had the tact, had, had a way of pulling him aside, commending what he was doing, but said, you know, there's, there's a piece missing. Let us give you that piece. And that piece is you need to become a believer. You need to become born again. And they introduced to him uh, that Jesus was the Christ explain that to him. He loves God's word. And uh, I respect people, even if they're not a believer, if they love God's word, they're, they're, they're an Apollos in the making. I don't want to dismiss that. I don't want to cut them off from that. I don't want to make light of that. Uh, if they, I, I work with a lot of people who love God's word, but they're not born again uh, among Mennonite, uh, Amish people who who have a respect for God, have a respect for God's word, they're missing a piece and they need to be introduced to Jesus uh, as often the missing piece. But we don't kick that out from under them, we use it. And that's what happens. So then he's on fire and he goes into the synagogue and he vigorously refuted uh, the Jews publicly, showing from the scripture that Jesus is the Christ. So powerful. Now let's go to Acts chapter 19. Now let's look at Acts chapter 19. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth. So right away he's being put in the ministry. Uh, faster than what we would do here. We'd say you need three years of Bible school. You need something else and, and some kind of degree. Uh, he's going by grace. He has grace and so he's being used in the ministry. He's uh, working in, in, in Ephesus. He's working in uh, uh, Corinth. And uh, Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Some translations say, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? New King James says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? However you phrase that question, it's a profound question. It meant Paul believed that you could be born again, you could know the Lord, and not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, this is a very dumb question. And this is his first question. First questions tend to reveal priorities. So Paul gets among these disciples. His first question, the priority question, is have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Or did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? 
Paul didn't believe, as, as is commonly taught today, that when you're born again, you receive everything that there is. You receive the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's over. There's, not, there's no additional experiences to expect. He expected another experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They said to him, we have not so, uh, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. He said to them, into what then have you been baptized? Were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Well, that was 20 years before. They're not born again. They're not believers. The fact that they're the disciples, uh, what we do today in many of our circles is we'll take the word disciples and mentally translate that to being born again believers. Uh, disciples, there are lots of disciples who are not born again believers. Uh, they could be disciples of the word. They could be I picture these people living uh, not like Gentiles, not like Jews, living a separated life, living in some kind of community. Um, there's, a, uh, there's about 12 men. We don't know how many women and children, but there's a community there. They're separated unto God, and they're separated to the Word of God. So they're disciples. In other words, they're students and um, not necessarily believers. Paul, as he questions them, he finds out that they're not believers. I've heard different people teach that they are because they mistakenly use the word disciple to categorically describe them as born again believers. Disciples can be disciples of the word. There are disciples in Brooklyn, in synagogues who study God's word. They are disciples. The Pharisees had disciples. Uh, different groups, different religious groups have disciples. If you went to Tibet, you'd find Buddhist disciples. If you went to India, you'd find Hindu disciples. There are lots of people who are disciples in the sense that they're students who are studying something, living a separated life, living uh, cloistered away, and that's what was happening here. So he said, um, key question, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. John's baptism was a great conditioner. It softened people's hearts. You can imagine 400 years, no word from God, no revival, 400 years, uh, almost twice as long as America has been with no word from God, no prophet, no moving of the, of the spirit in a, in a mighty way. And all of a sudden, John comes along and people's hearts, there's layers a film of, of filth of sin and religiousness and, and a, a dryness. And all of that is peeled away through a powerful response to a prophet. And they responded to John's preaching. That, the effect of that carried for a long time. It, it softened their heart. It conditioned their heart to be more receptive to God. So Paul says, very simply, John did... John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they said, okay. If John said that, we'll submit. In other words, there was this tremendous softness. The only people who didn't have the softness were the Jews, the, the religious Jews, the, the leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees, they couldn't submit. They couldn't respond to the word of God. Look how, compli how compliant these people are uh, because they've had their hearts softened through the baptism of repentance. And he said uh, they were to receive um, him who came after, Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now they're born again. They would never have been baptized unless they're born again. They're born again. And when Paul laid hands on them, verse 6, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied, which again shows how, how compliant, how soft their heart was. Their heart was so open that they easily received the baptism of the Spirit, easily received speaking in tongues and prophesying. <clears throat> you don't see that happen very often. Even today, their hearts were soft. <clears throat> Their hearts were conditioned. <clears throat> I 
their hearts were soft, their hearts were conditioned um, to receive everything God had for them. And that was the basis of one of the greatest churches in the, in the New Testament. The church at Ephesus, a great church, came out of, out of this group of 12 men whose hearts were soft, who were baptized with the mighty Holy Spirit. I think, I think you should consider this for yourself. How open are you? How compliant are you? How respectful are you to the Word of God? Is your heart soft? where you can say, whatever God has for me, I will receive it and submit to water baptism, submit to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, submit to the power of God, speaking in tongues and prophesying. This is a tremendous openness uh, that we rarely see today. I've only seen this happen a few times where people are this open. Uh, it's a power powerful, powerful thing. You're not having to drag them into the truth or drag them uh, resisting. These are like Bereans in the sense that their hearts are so respectful of God and His Word that they're willing to comply, willing to do whatever He puts in their heart to do. Verse 7, Now when the men were about, uh, the, the men were uh, about 12 in all, and they uh, he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months. So he stays around, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. We have to preach the kingdom of God. In a nutshell, for me, the kingdom of God is that God had been king, rejected as king. Then they had men who were kings, and they regretted that right away. And they said, we want God to be king again. When God was king, uh, we had peace. When God was king, we had prosperity. When God was king, we never lost a war. He had a health plan that was out of this world. He ruled and he reigned. And uh, then they lost that. Men became kings. Everything went south. The economy went south. Uh, those kings led them into uh, away from God rather than closer to God. But when they cried out, they said, we want you to be king again. He promised that he would become king again. But this time, he was going to be king in a way that they could see him, that he'd be born among them, coming through the tribe uh, of Judah, and that he would, he'd be um, from the uh, root of Jesse. And so they kept looking for this Messiah who would be uh, king, God as king, uh, again, called the Son of Man. Daniel presented him as the one who was coming as the Son of Man. So it's God coming as man. They fully expected that. And, and so uh, when Jesus and John came, they said the kingdom of God is at hand. It's now. It's within reach. <clears throat> it's no longer someday. It's now. And they brought it into the now. And Jesus, everywhere he went, demonstrated the kingdom of God. What's in heaven is now come to earth. You can have the peace of heaven, the joy of heaven, the power of heaven, the blessing of heaven, and that God... God wants to rule and reign in our lives, sitting on the throne of our hearts. And rather than a kingdom that you could, you could see, one that you could observe and say, that's the kingdom in building and lands and geographically limited, he said, this kingdom is different. This kingdom is going to be invisible. It's going to be a kingdom of the heart. And so Paul was preaching this, uh, persuading them, let God be in charge of your life. Submit to God. Let him rule and reign. Let Jesus come in your heart and sit on your heart. That is the kingdom of God which we need to preach. People will respond to that. People are disillusioned with the kingdom of men, with government of men, uh, with men being in control, men being in charge. That's, it doesn't work, and they know that. So what we say is it doesn't matter what the government does. It doesn't matter what, what you've been taught, or even what religion has provided for you, why don't you give your life to Jesus? Let him become the king of your heart. Let him rule and reign. Let him be the decider of your heart, of your life. Let him be the one being in control. That's the kingdom of God. People, people want that. They're longing for that. They can't resist that when you preach that and you present that to them. It has to be, it has to be practical. It can't be theory. The kingdom of God is some kind of mythical, mystical theory. It has to be practical. We have to bring it into the now. It says, but, verse 9, But when some of them 
were hardened and did not believe. Uh, hardness of heart is um, it's a silent killer. They say heart disease is a silent killer. Uh, we shouldn't be worried about heart disease as much as hardening of the heart. They hardened their heart. They spoke evil of the way uh, before the multitude. And so he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And so what Paul does here is very, very interesting. He's at Ephesus. The Jewish people move him out of the synagogue, so he goes into a school. And the reason that there's a school is because there's disciples. And that means students. If you look up the word disciple, it simply means learner. They're students. So Paul is now based, rather than in the synagogue, he's based in a school, and he's reasoning with them daily. We find out later that Paul says, I was with you daily, uh, preaching morning and evening uh, with tears, that when I leave, wolves are going to come in. And that was at Ephesus. So we know Paul had this pattern. You can imagine how, what it, what it would be like today if you were to plant a church where you had the people morning and evening. All morning you could, tell, you could teach them. You could lay in big concepts of the Word of God. Within three months, you could really establish a church if you had a morning and evening, the same people, and you take them someplace. Uh, these people come into the power of God. They come in the... They had the baptism of spirit, but next thing you know, there's apostles and prophets, and, and they're, they're starting to emerge. But also from Ephesus, one of the things that's so powerful is the gospel went from Ephesus and went all through Asia Minor. So it went to all the places of the seven churches that, that uh, John later on became the leader of. And um, uh, Jesus wrote letters to the seven churches of Asia. They all come out of Ephesus. Not that Paul went out into Asia Minor and went around the poster route, went around the, uh, the, this large landmass to these seven churches. Actually, there are more than seven. There's a couple more that aren't mentioned. For example, Colossae. Colossae is maybe, I think, about 100 miles from Ephesus. Uh, I've walked over the mound of Colossae, what, what, where the city was. Uh, not a very big place. Nearby is Thess uh, Laodicea, which was one of the seven churches. Nearby there is Hierapolis, uh, and there was a church there as well, quite a large Christian community. While these were all very close to each other, you know, 20 kilometers here, uh, uh, 50, 60 km kilometers there, uh, they're pretty close together. Paul wrote to the Colossians and, sa uh, Colossians and said, You have not seen my face. That tells me that Paul didn't go to Colossae and start the church. What had happened, he's based at the school, and, and the young men and women who were in the school listening to him, reasoning day and night as he's preaching, they were so impacted by the gospel and by the, by the truths that Paul was teaching, they went out and established churches all over Asia Minor. So they went to all the places, Philadelphia, Thyatira, all these places heard the gospel, but it came out of two years, Paul based in one place. And it was like a, a, a ripple effect that went all over Asia Minor. Very, very powerful when you think of that in terms of church planting. That you could have one central location, like say Penyan, but we get all these people coming to Penyan. What if we so impacted them with God's word and uh, power of the Holy Spirit that they went out into all these areas roundabout and started churches all coming out of Penyan. Uh, that would be exactly what happened to Paul here at Ephesus. In fact, I'd love to see that happen. Everywhere I go, I want to see that happen. So he continued with them for two years. And verse 10 says, uh, after two years, all who dwelt in Asia, that's quite a statement, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So all of Asia heard the gospel uh, about Jesus Christ, but Paul didn't go through all of Asia. Do you remember we read previously that Paul was forbidden to go to, he was forbidden to go, he wanted to go different places, but he's being 
checked by the Spirit. Uh, it wasn't that the, Asia wasn't uh, a target of the Holy Spirit. He certainly, that, that certainly was a place that the Holy Spirit wanted to get to. But how he did that is profound. Rather than Paul going place by place throughout all Asia Minor, he put him in one place, and from there all of Asia heard the word. It's just a different strategy. It just shows we need to be spirit-filled. We need to be spirit-led. We need to be directed by the Holy Spirit. Amen.